Chapter 1, Initiation June 15th, 1975 I proudly strolled across the wax hardwood stage of the auditorium at the 50 Fourth Street Elementary School under the beaming stairs of my mother, aunt, and uncle Clarence taking my assigned place next to Joe Johnson. As we had rehearsed for a week, I felt very different, older, more attached than any of my fellow classmates. This feeling made me stand more erect, made me seem more important than any of my peers on stage, even Joe Johnson, who was the king of the school. Looking back now, it's quite amusing to remember how proud I was and how superior I felt next to Joe Johnson. I first since my radical departure from childhood when I was suspended a month before graduation, driven home by Mr. Smotherman, the principal, and not allowed to go on the grad class outing for flashing a gain sign on the school panorama picture. Mr. Smotherman was appalled and accused me of destroying a perfectly good picture, not to mention that I was starting to show signs of moral decay. Actually, Half of the things Mr. Smotherman told me, I didn't catch because I wasn't listening. And besides, my mind had been made up weeks prior to my having gotten caught flashing the sign on a panorama picture. How I expected to get away with flashing on a photograph is beyond me. But too, it points up my serious intent even then. For I was completely sold on becoming a gang member. As our graduation activities bore on, my disinterest and annoyance at its silliness escalated. I was eager to get home to the hood and to meet my moral obligation to my new set of friends who made Joe Johnson look weak. After the seemingly year-long graduation, my mom, aunt, uncle Clarence congratulated me with lunch at Bob's Big Boy. I was the second youngest in a family of six. Everyone's name began with a K. My brothers were Kevin, Curran, and Kershawn. The youngest, Kim and Candace, were my sisters. My father and I never got along, and I couldn't understand why he mistreated me. While returning home, I sat transfixed to the side window, looking out into the streets, but not seeing anything in particular. Just wishing my Uncle Clarence would drive faster. Tonight was to be my initiation night, and I didn't want to be late or miss out any activities that might occur during my first night on duty. Bending the corner onto our block... In my uncle's Monte Carlo, I sunk down in the back seat to avoid being seen in my white knit suit and tie, peeking to make sure the coast was clear. I bolted past moms and into the house, down the hall, and into my room for a quick change. What's your damn problem, boy? bellowed moms from the hallway. I know you don't think you're going out anywhere until you have cleaned up that funky room, taken out this trash, and... I never heard the rest. I was out the window and in the wind, streaming toward my destiny and the only thing in this life that has ever held my attention for any serious length of time, the streets. Stopping once I gotten around the block to collect my coolness, I met up with Trey Ball, who accepted my membership and agreed to sponsor me in. What's up, cuz? Trey Ball extends his very dark, muscular vein hand. Ain't nothing. I responded trying to hide my utter admiration for this cat who was quickly becoming a ghetto star. A ghetto star is a neighborhood celebrity known for gang banging, drug dealing, and so on. So what's up for tonight? Am I still on or what? Yeah, you on. As we walked to the shack in silence, I took full advantage of the star stares we were getting from onlookers who couldn't seem to make the connection between me and Trayball. The neighborhood held them. I took their looks of stairs of recognition and respect. At the shack, which was actually a back house behind Trey Ball's house, I met Huckabuck, who was dark, athletic, very physical, and awesome fighter. He came to California from New York, accent included. For the most part, he was quiet. Leprechaun, who we called Lep, was there. I had known him prior to this, as he went to school with my older brother. Lep had a missing front tooth and a slight build. Fiercely loyal to Trey Ball. Lep stood to be second in command. There was Fly, who dressed cool with an air of style, light complexion and handsome. He was a ladies' man, not necessarily vicious, but was gaining a reputation by the company he kept. Next was GC, which stood for Gangster Cool. GC was possibly the most well-off member present, meaning he had things, things our parents could not afford to give us. He gang-banged the Stacey Adams shoes. 
What's your name, homeboy? Uncle Buck asks from across the room through a loud cloud of marijuana smoke. Cody. My name is Cody. Cody. There's always somebody named Cody from the 90s. I already knew this from hearing his name. Yeah, but my real name is Cody. My mother named me that. Everyone looked at me hard and I squinted under their stairs. But I held my ground. The flinch now will possibly mean explosion. What? Huck said with disbelief. Your mother named you Cody? Yeah, no shit, I replied. Righteous, fuck it. Then we'll back you with that. But you gotta put in work. Put in work means a military mission to hold it, because that's a hell of a name. Fly piped up from his relaxed poster in an armchair. I'm going to put some work in the night for the set. We know, Lep replied, we know. GC, who was dressed like a gas station attendant in blue khakis with a matching shirt. And I started out to steal a car. All eyes were on me tonight, but I felt no nervousness, and there was no hesitation in any of my actions. This was my rite of passage to manhood. And I took each order as seriously as any African would in any initiation ritual from childhood to manhood. GC was the expert car thief among the set. Gone in 60 seconds, could have very well been patterned after him. He had learned his technique from Marilyn, our older homegirl, who always keeps at least two stolen cars on hand. Tonight we were out to get an ordinary car, possibly a 65 Mustang or a 68 Cougar. These, I learned, can be hot wired from the engine with as little as clothes hangers touched on the alternator than the battery. The only drawbacks here were that the gas gods, radio, and horn would not work and the car would only run until the alternator burned out. Nevertheless, we found the Mustang, blue and very sturdy. GC worked to get the hood up and I kept point with the 38 revolver. I was instructed to fire on any light in the house and anyone attempting to stop us from getting this car. I pasted it in a tight to and fro motion watching closely for any sign of movement from either the house, the yard, or the shrubbery flanking the house. I was the perfect sentry, for had any movement occurred or any light flashed on, I would have emptied six rounds into the area, if not the person. Actually, I had only fired a real gun once, and that was into the air. Under the cloak of darkness, I heard GC grunt once and lift the hood. It took him longer to unlatch the hood than to start the car. The engine turned once, then twice, and finally it caught and roared to life. It's on, GC said, with as much pride as any brand new father looking for the first time as his newborn child. We slapped hands in a guest of success and jumped in. Pulling out the driveway, I noticed the light turn on in what I believed to be the kitchen. I reached for the door handle with every intent of shooting into the house, but GC grabbed my arm and said, don't sweat it. We got the car now. On the way back to the shack, I practiced my mad dog stares on the occupants of the cars. Beside us at stoplights. I guess I wasn't too convincing because on more than a few occasions I was laughed at. And I also got a couple of smiles in return. This was definitely in an area to be worked on. At the shack, we smoked pot, drank beer, and geared up for the mission, which still had not been disclosed to me. But I was confident in my ability to pull it off. <clears throat> I have never ever felt as secure as I did <clears throat> then in the presence of these cats who were growing fonder of me. It seemed with each successive level of drunkenness they reached. Cuz, you gonna be down, watch. Let pronounced as if telling a son-in-law school he will be a great lawyer. He stood over me and continued. I remember your little ass used to ride dirt bikes and skateboards acting crazy and shit. Now you wanna be a gangster, huh? You wanna hang with the real motherfuckers and tear shit up, huh? His tone was probing. But approving, he was talking with the heated passion and the power of a general father. Stand up, get your little ass up. How old is you now, anyway? Eleven, but I'll be twelve in November. Damn, I never thought about being too young. At this time, I stood up in front of Lep and never saw the blow to my head from Huck. Bam! And I was on all four, struggling for equilibrium. Kicked in the stomach, I was on my back, counting stars and blackness. Grabbed by the collar, I was made to stand again. A solid blow to my chest exploded. Pain and bold red letters on blank screen that had now become my mind. Bam! Another, then another. Blames rained on me from every direction. I felt like a pinball. I knew that if I went down again, I'd be kicked. And from that way that last kick fell, I was almost certain that GC had kicked me with his point of Stacey Adams. Up until this point, not a word had been spoken. I had heard about being courted, and courted means to be accepted through a barrage of tests, usually physical, though this can 
include shooting people or jumped in. But somehow, in my little child, this mind, I had envisioned it to be a noble gathering. Paperwork, arguments about my worth and my ability in regard to Veller. In the heat of desperation, I struck out, hitting Fly full in the chest, knocking him back. Then I just started swinging with no style of finesse, just anger and the instinct to survive. Of course, this did little to help my physical situation, but it showed the others that I had a will to live. And this, in turn, reflected my ability to represent the set in hand-to-hand combat. The blow stopped abruptly, and the sound of breathing filled the air. My ear was bleeding, and my neck and face were deep red, but I was still standing. When I think about it now, I realize that it wasn't necessarily my strength that kept me on my feet, but the ways in which I was hit. Before I could sag or slump, I was hit and lifted back up to standing. Trey Ball came in and immediately recognized what had taken place, looking hard at me. Then at the others, he said, it's time to handle this shit. They out there. In a flash, Lep was under the couch retrieving weapons. Guns I never knew were there. Two 12-gauge shotguns, both sawed off. One a pump action, the other a single shot. A .4 IO shotgun, also a single shot, and a 44 Magnum that had no trigger guard and broke open the load. GC was now in possession of the 38 I had held earlier. Give Cody the pump. Train Ball's voice voice echoed over the clanging of steel chambers opening and closing, cylinders turning, and the low hum of music in the background. Check this out. Trey Ball spoke with the calm of a football coach. Cody, you got eight shots. You don't come back to the car unless they're all gone. Righteous, I said, eager to show my work. These fools have been hanging out here for days now, hitting people up. Hitting people up means asking where they're from, i.e. which gang they're down with. Flagging and disrespecting every crip in the world. I sat straight back and hung on every word Trey Ball said. Tonight we're going to rock they world. Hand slaps are passed around the room and then Lep spoke up. If anybody get caught for this ride to be, because ain't no snitching here. Head nods and looks of firmness were exchanged. And then the moment of truth. We piled into the Mustang, Trey Ball driving. And without a gun, Lep sat next to Trey Ball with the old guy. 44 hook directly behind Lep. Held the 4 IO between his legs. F- fly next to him. Held the sawed off single shot 12 gauge. I sat next to him with the pump, and GC was on my left with his 38 in silence. We drove block after block north into enemy territory. There they go, Lep said, spotting the gathering of about 15 people. Damn, they deep too. Look at them fools. I looked at the enemy and thought, tonight is the night, and I'll never stop until I killed them all. After driving down another block, we stopped and got out, each checking his weapon, mine being the most complicated. We started out on foot. To rid the world of the bloods, rims in particular. Stealthily, we crept up to where the gathering had assembled to promote their set's ideology. Trey Ball sat idle in the car and was to meet us halfway after we had worked over the enemy. Hanging close to buildings, houses, and bushes, we made our way, one after the other, to within spitting distance of the bloods. Our strategy was to jump out and shoot, but on the way, let made the point that the single shots to go first and I follow suit with the eight shots. Lep with five shots and the 44 and GC with six and the 38. Huck and Fly step from the shadows simulus, sim, simultaneously and were never noticed until it was too late. Boom, boom, boom. Heavy bodies hitting the ground. Confusion. Yells of dismay. Running and then the second wave of gunfire. By my sixth shot, I had advanced past the first fallen bodies into the street in pursuit of those who had sought refuge behind cars and trees. Forgetting everything, I completely threw myself in the battle. A blood who had seemingly got away tried to make one last dash from the safe area of the car to, I think, a porch. I remember raising my weapon and looking back for a split second as if we communicated on another level and overstood who he was. Then I pulled the trigger and laid him down with one shot. Left, I jogged back to the initial site of contact, knowing fully that I had split orders not to return with any rounds in my weapon. I turned and fired on the house before which they had originally stood. Not twenty paces later, Trey Ball sped to a stop and we all piled in, frighteningly amped from the climax of battle. Back in the shack, we smoked more pot and drank more beer. I was the center of attention from my acts of aggression. Man, did you see that little motherfucker out there? Flep said the Huck with an air of disbelief. Yeah, I saw him. I knew he was going to be down. I knew it in. Shut up, man. Just shut the fuck up. Because he could still tell on all of us. Silence rang heavy in my ears. And I knew I had to respond to Lep's reaction. If I get caught, I'll ride the beef. I ain't no snitch. 
Although my little statement lessened the tension, Lep's words had a most sobering effect. Trey Ball announced my full membership and congratulations to Gimmer from all. It was the proudest moment of my life. Trey Ball told me to stay after the others had left. I milled the round still high from battle and thought of nothing else but putting in work for the set. Check this out, Trey Ball said. You got potential because you're eager to learn. Banging ain't no part-time thing. It's full-time. It's a career. It's being down when in, ain't nobody else down with you. It's getting caught and not telling. Killing and not caring. And dying without fear. It's love for your set and hate for the enemy. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I said. And I had heard him and never forgot nothing he said from that point on. Also from the point on, Trey Ball became my mentor, friend, confident, and closest comrade. He allowed me acts of aggression that made my name soar with alarming effects. The seriousness of what I had done the evening did not dawn on me until I was home alone that night. My heart had a slow to its normal pace, and the alcohol and pot had worn off. I was left in with just myself and the awesome flashes of light that lit up my mind to reveal bodies in abnormal positions, grotesque shapes, twisting and bending in arcs that defy bone structure. The actual impact was on my return back past the bodies of the first fallen. My first real look at bodies torn to shreds. It did little to me then, because it was all about survival, but as I lay wide awake in my bed, safe alive, I felt guilty and ashamed of myself. Upon further contemplation, I felt they were too easy to kill. Why had they been out there? I tried every conceivable alibi within the realm of reason to justify my actions. There was none. I slept very little that night. I never told anyone else about these feelings before. In the neighborhood, respect was forthcoming. In 1977, when I was 13... While robbing a man, I turned my head and was hit in the face. The man tried to run but was tripped by a trade ball who had then held him for me. I stopped him for 20 minutes before leaving him unconscious in the alley. Later that night, I learned that the man had lapsed into a coma and was disfigured from my stopping. The police told bystanders the person responsible for this was a monster. The name stuck, and I took that monkey over my birth name. As monster, however... I, try, I had consistently be more vicious to live up to that name. Trade Ball was there for me at every level. But Trade Ball was at least four years older than I still. We could relate. In 1978, Trade Ball was captured for knocking a guy out in front of the police who was questioning him about being robbed. I was left with Fly, Lep, Huck, and GC, who seemed to have lost their will to get busy. When Trade Ball was locked up, so I went in search of a road dog or best friend. I had been seeing the name Crazy D written on walls for some time, and I had a pretty good idea who he was. While walking up the alley one day toward GC's house, I ran into Crazy D. We formally introduced ourselves, and I asked him if he wanted to kick it with us. Although he was already from the set, he kicked it with other people. A jovial cat of my age with happy eyes and a Hollywood smile. D became my road dog. He kicked it right away with the others, too. I took him over to the white apartments where we had everybody and their parents claiming or sympathizing with our set. He loved it. From this point on, D and I were inseparable. The set was still relatively small and everyone knew each other. And speaking of small here, I mean approximately 75 to 85 people. That's a small set. Today it's not unusual for sets to be a thousand deep. Though there were various sides and sections, we all met up at meetings in our park. Though this usually occurred only when someone had been killed or some serious infection had been committed. I continued to see the associate with G.C. Lepp and the others, but it wasn't the same with Trey Ball missing. He was the glue that bonded us. Besides this, I had escalated from little homie to homie. I was putting in much work and dropping many bodies. In fact, some shied away from me because I took things and said too serious. But Crazy D overstood me and my thirst for reputation, the purpose of all gang members. For I had learned early that there were three stages of reputation to go through before the title OG original gangster would apply righteously. Step one, you must build the reputation of your name, i.e. as you as individual. Step two, you must build your name in association with the particular set. So when your name is spoken, your set is also spoken of in the same breath for it is synonymous. And step three, you must establish yourself as a motor or a crip or blood, depending of course, and which side of color bar you live. In 1978, I was 14 and still working on the first stage, but I had as much ambition, vitality, and ruthlessness to succeed as any corporate executive planning a hostile takeover. The merger was out of question. Gang banging in the 70s was totally different than what's going on today. The gang community on both sides was relatively small, contained in certain areas, and sustained by few who kept the faith in their belief. Although all gang members are in the military, all gang members are not combat soldiers. Those who 
or stand out in all fear and respect them. This is true up to this day. By now, of course, I'd acquired my own weapon, a blue steel 44 Bulldog. It was small and fit into my pocket. I kept it on me at all times. One afternoon, my little brother and a friend, both later will become fierce combat soldiers in their own right. We're eating chili dogs at Art's Frank's. My brother's companion left his chili dog wrapper on the out door table and it blew to the ground. Eric, who had been hired by Art as not just a cook but a watchdog, was a hothead already and needed little provoking to act like a complete fool. He told my brother to pick up the paper and my brother explained that it was not his paper. Eric became angry and collared my brother and ripped his shirt. Angry and confused, my little brother went home and got my mother, older brother, and sister. I was out on a 10 speed patrolling the hood. With the course, my 44, ironically, I was sitting on the corner of Florence and Normandy Avenue across from Arts. When I saw my mother's car with everyone in it, pulled to a stop at the light, here I was, waiting for some action, and it pulled right up fate, I guess. My older brother signaled for me, so I followed them across the street to Arts. No one knew I was strapped. As I rolled up, my older brother was standing there arguing with Eric. Then my brother hit Eric in the face and then began to fight. I immediately dismounted and rushed up on Eric's flank to get a hit in. But he was swift and struck me in the air, knocking me back. All the while, my mother was frantically shouting for us to stop. Stop the fighting, mad now. And insulted, I drew my weapon, aimed, and pulled the trigger. Click. Damn, I remember thinking I only got three bullets and I didn't know where in the cylinder they were. The click stopped everything and then everybody seemed to move on at once. Eric ran toward the chili stand. My brother rushed to me. Before I could aim and fire, my brother and I were wrestling over the gun. Give me the gun. I'll shoot him. My brother exclaimed, no, let me shoot him. I shot back in our battle for control. The gun was now pointing at my mother's chest. Click. My mother jumped in momentarily. I was paralyzed with fright. In an instant, I let go of the gun and my brother turned and fired into the chili stand. Boom. The forty four sounded like a cannon. Click. Another empty chamber. Eric had by now retrieved his shotgun and was on his way out after us. Seeing him coming, both my brother and I turned to ran. We had barely rounded the corner when the report from the shotgun echoed behind us. He chased us through several yards, firing and tearing up people's property. He fired a total of eight times, but we escaped unscathed, except for our pride. My mother, sister, and little brother also escaped unharmed though in great fear for us, for they knew not our fate. After meeting back at my home, my mother wanted to send us all to my uncle's house in West Covina. We protested and stayed. The next morning, however, while I'm standing at the bus stop, waiting to go to school, Eric pulls up, mad dogs me. What you looking at, punk? He shouts from the car. You motherfucker. I responded, though scared because he may have a gun and I couldn't get mine out the house since after yesterday's episode, mom was searching me. And there were three young ladies standing there as well, so my pride and integrity was also involved, not to mention my reputation. I had to stand my ground. Eric leapt from the car, circled from the front, walked up, and hit me in the mouth. Bam! I faltered and became indecisive, but in the instant, I knew I needed an equalizer. Before he lifted his shirt to reveal the butt of a pistol in his waistband, I turned and bolted, running at top speed with tears streaming down my face. I made my way back home, went right in, got my gun, and trotted it back to the bus stop. I was hoping the bus hadn't come so that the three girls who saw me get hit could watch me kill him. Art's chili dog stand has been on Florence and Normandy since the 40s, and it was still in its original decor, open and primarily wood, with big windows facing in the Florence Avenue. The bus stop was across Florence on Normandy, turning the corner on 71st at a steady trot. I was relieved to find the three girls still there. Almost as if waiting for me. Passing them, I heard one say to the other, That boy is crazy. I was taking no chances this time. With six rounds ready, I stood in the street in front of Arts on Florence Avenue. Commuter traffic was moderate, so I waited for the light to turn red. Once I saw that I could safely break across Florence and into the backyard, I opened fire on Arts. Boom, boom. Loud baritone echoes cracked this morning stillness. As chunks of wooden shards of glass flew off arts with magical quickness. Cordite filled my nostrils and revenge filled my heart. Boom, 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 boom. Six shots I emptied into the tiny dwelling, hoping to have killed Eric, who had just opened up for business. No such luck. I was captured the next day and given 60 days in juvenile hall. Actually only served 19 due to overcrowding. Once out, my reputation was stronger than ever. Even Eric gave me my props, though grudgingly. The very next week after my release for the shooting, D, myself, and two other members of the Rolling 60 Crips 
The later the 60s and my set day trades to become mortal enemies, we're on our way to Rosecrans Skating Rink, which was where everybody who was somebody in the gang room went to further promote their name and set. Walking up Manchester Avenue westbound, we passed Pearl's Gym and Best Shat Hair Salon, still within the established boundaries of my set. We came to a halt at the corner of Manchester and Grand Mercy Place, waiting for the light to change so we could trek to Vaness, where our bus was to, to depart. We heard two reports from what sounded like a 38. The sound came from the direction of Duke's Hamburger Stand, which stood on the southeast corner of Grand Mercy Place off Manchester Avenue. Duke's had recently become contested territory as the Inglewood family bloods had begun to frequent it regularly in hopes of establishing in his ears. Gangs tend to function as states in regard to taking or colonizing territory. We looked toward the sound and we saw a flying track breaking out of Duke's, running right at us across the street. Track had what appeared to be a big long barrel 38 revolver in his left hand. Without stopping, Track exclaimed, Yo, Bell, we just busted on some families. They kept running right on past us. We hadn't done nothing, so we kept on our way. Not a minute later, a white Camaro screeched out of Duke's parking lot. There they go. We heard an almost hysterical voice yell from the car. A second car, a huge orange Chrysler, came out the parking lot bearing down on the bumper of the Camaro, which was now heading directly for us. We scattered. D and I darted into an adjust alley behind Best Yet, and I don't know where Stone and Snoopy went. The chase was on. Hopping a fence in the alley, D and I hid ourselves in the dense shrubbery behind Pearl's gym. The Camaro and the Chrysler roared up and down the alley several times as we lay in wait. The thoughts that ran through my head were hopes that the blood who had been shot would die. It's significant that there were no crip on crip wars raging in these times. The worst enemies are crip and blood sets today, of course. Crips are the number one killer of crips. In fact, Crips have killed more Crips in the last 12 years than the Bloods have killed in the entire 22-year conflict. And two sets in the Crip and Blood communities have increased 20-fold, so that there is literally a gang on every street. Also, there are huge conglomerate sets spanning hundreds of city blocks at a time, extending themselves into other cities and counties. It's not all unusual for one of these huge conglomerate sets to be police by five separate divisions of both the LAPD and the Sheriff's Department. The East Coast Crips are one set set spanning from 1st Street in downtown Los Angeles to 225th Street in Harbor City. After an hour or so, we emerged from hiding and walked east in search of Snoopy and Stone. Man, them fools was mad, huh? Deke spoke up. If they would have caught us, Cody, we would have been through. Deke was very serious when I finally looked at him. Why you didn't bring the gat? Gat is a generic term for gun anyway. Because of the metal detector at Rosecrans. Ever since the families blew the door off, they've been really tight on security. Besides, all homies be there anyway. We found Snoopy and Stowe standing on Western Avenue in Manchester, well aware that the families were now out and mass looking for revenge. We devised a new strategy for getting to the skating rink. Just then, the orange Chrysler hit the corner of 85th Street, packed with occupants from the red side. We had two choices, run into the street and try to make it across Western and further into the end interior of our hood and possible safety or run into the surplus store behind us and hope they went to follow in such a big civilian crowd we click quickly chose the second option d broke first with myself snoopy and stone heavy on his heels looking back i immediately realized that we had made a terrible decision for the bloods were bailing out of the huge chrysler like beans from a bag and chasing us straight up into the store I remember taking one last look back after I had jumped the turnstile, and I knew that we were trapped. The surplus kept a huge green trash can by the door that was full of axe handles of heavy oak. Each blood grabbed the one as he entered. Alarmed and not knowing if it was a gang raid on his store, the manager locked the door once the last blood I come in. I knew we'd be beaten to death. Snoopy and Stone went one way and D and I went another. I followed D up some stairs that led to the attic supply room and further entrapment. Four bloods followed us up, swearing to kill us for shooting a homeboy. One guy was shouting about the victim being his brother. Damn, how in the hell we gotten into this? Running up into the small attic area, I thought seriously about death for the first time in my life. And for the slightest second, I wanted to turn and tell the bloods, hey, all right, I quit. I'm only 13. Can't we talk? Diplomacy was a f was as foreign as Chinese to, all, to us all. But it's a trip that when under pressure, clear thoughts seem to abound. Stopping and crouching temporarily, having lost my tail among the rows and aisles of stock clothing. I heard D trying to explain that it wasn't him. And they had made a mistake. Hold it, man. It wasn't us. I heard D say in a cracking tone of sincerity and terror. 